are in Baird country. So today we have a very exciting guest, Tori Baird or Victoria. She goes by Tori, except like for really important stuff. Anyways, um, she is the uh, owner and operator of Paddle Like a Girl, which is a business in which she teaches backcountry camping and canoeing skills, often right off here, uh, uh, right off of our property here in Magnetowan, Ontario. And it's geared toward women and empowering women. Um, she also is the host of uh, Tori Goes Outside, which is a really, I think, exciting Instagram page. Currently has a video going viral, although that's mostly our son Hudson. Yeah, totally. Has like over 40 million <laughs> views. <laughs> Hudson singing Johnny Johnny. Um, she's also an experienced backcountry traveler, having winter camped uh, and also ventured deep into the backcountry in the Yukon, into very remote areas by snowmobile, also on on by snowshoe on foot. Uh, she's backpacked across the Rockies from uh, Jasper to Grand Cache, and she's paddled some of the most remote uh, wilderness rivers in northern Canada, including the Mountain River in the Northwest Territories, the East Natashquan, and the Porcupine, and now is probably one of the bravest paddlers I know because she goes out there uh, as a family with our two young kids. So anyways, Tori, welcome to the show. Glad thank you. you. Could, glad you could make it. I know you're busy with all kinds of stuff. Yes, thank you so much for having me to your beautiful home. You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't really have much of a choice either way, but let's be honest. <laughs> you know my bio better than I do, so that's good. I, I nailed that. Huh? Yeah, you did. Good, good. Um, so how are you doing today? Good. I'm feeling a little stressed out. Why is that? Because um, I'm trying to get a video finished for tomorrow. So you <laughs> know how that goes. What? Why don't you share what you are editing? So I am editing our Stikeen River series mm -hmm. still. Uh, we're on, oh geez, overall I think it's episode 10, but of the actual river series, this is episode four. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's going to be maybe eight episodes um i think you're gonna go with eight, eh? i don't know yet today yeah. this episode is is two days mm -hmm. uh so mm -hmm. usually it's like an episode per day but i've i've condensed it into yeah. one video for two I've, days as yeah. you know i've done a lot of editing and it mm -hmm. can be all encompassing like it you is. can't think about anything else so many things on your mind at once yeah um, well, and especially on that trip, cause we have the two kids, mm -hmm. the dog and roughly four cameras and also a drone. Why don't you, I don't know, explain a little bit about the trip. Oh, okay. So the trip itself. So, mm -hmm. um, so in September we drove, uh, from our home in Magnetowan, uh, in Ontario mm -hmm. to across the country to Northern BC. Uh, we took 11 days to drive there. We were staying we would camp out overnight in our camper trailer it's kind of like a teardrop trailer uh, except it's a little bit more rugged it's an off-grid off-roading trailer mm -hmm. um the kids and i would sleep in the trailer and jim got the luxuries of sleeping in the tent and mm -hmm. give me the comfortable mattress in the trailer which was very nice of you mm -hmm. um and which actually i discovered on the very last night of our trip on the way back that the tent was actually the better place to from sleep. the road trip part the road trip yeah. i and discovered so we, i'd been ripped off is it basically. weird having to talk to me and to tell me this okay, yeah i'm like you are, I well, what know. am i telling you, you already, <laughs> yeah. weren't you there that's what i said i know there's gonna be some stuff like that because yeah. there's some stuff that i already know about you that i want the of listeners course. to know a little bit for sure yeah so we drove across the country more or less mm -hmm. from to telegraph creek on a crazy mountain road yes um which has sheer cliffs sometimes on either side of what's i consider to be a narrow gravel road through the mountains not something that you typically see in canada mm -mm. um and uh, i just as uh, that's kind of where the real adventure started that and then on the stikeen which you know had some pushy currents some rapids cold water we have our two little kids mm -hmm. overall as a mother out there even with the experience that you had how how did that make you feel what kind of emotions were kind of going through your head at times when you saw like potential danger you know it's it's interesting because i really do love going out on these trips i love camping i love road trips i really mm -hmm. do love road trips um but i it's honestly hard to just genuinely be enjoying it because I'm mm -hmm. constantly so 
worried about something and maybe I don't know if I worry more than your average person or if this is just how any average mother would feel but I'm just constantly thinking about the next step uh you know what needs to be done how the kids are feeling when's the last time they ate when's the last time they their diaper was changed where are we going to camp tonight where are we pulling over for lunch whatever I'm just constantly thinking about the kids and their needs and um Sure, of course, there are many, many times where I'm in the moment and enjoying it and like, you know, taking in the beauty and just like the experience. But for the most part, I think I'm just a bag of stress. So what you're (laughs) saying is on these big larger than life uh, adventures, you're just feeling stress and anxiety the entire time. Pretty much. Yeah. And now that I'm editing this series, actually, Hmm. I'm looking back at it. And it's so nice to actually be editing it because I can look at the footage and be like, wow, that was so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Where where was I? You know, because I well, just so you know, I'm having a blast out there. Uh, good. Yeah. I, I can tell watching the <laughs> watching the videos, watching the clips. I'm like, so there's a lot of shots of, you know, from mm-hmm. the GoPro of me in the in the bow and you in the stern. So you can see us both. Mm-hmm. And I'm just looking at my face in this footage and thinking, and I, I know how I'm feeling. I, I, mm-hmm. I can put myself right in the moment <laughs> and like, I can feel yeah. the stress and anxiety weighing on my chest. But then I look at you in the back of the canoe and like, you, you're just so happy. It's pouring <laughs> rain. It's windy. Yeah. It's cold. We're like, kind of, we're paddling these tricky currents and you're just, you're happy. Oh, take me back. <laughs> Whereas I'm, and I don't want to, I don't want it to sound bad or, or wrong because I do love it. Um, but it is really, really stressful and scary. And okay, let's talk about that. Let's get more specific on this. You're okay. talking about not every single trip you do with the kids. You're no. talking about the Stickeen River and the Telegraph Creek Road where mm-hmm. there was, we were driving beside cliffs and then the Stickeen River where you know, we had tricky currents in, in some areas, but more or less horrific weather for just day after day after day after day. And everything was cold and soaked. It's a, that's where you were feeling. Yeah. Not just like every time. No. So, so I guess why, I mean, would, do you know what type two fun is? Are you familiar with type two fun? Of course. Yes. So type two fun, just so people that don't know, is like fun. That's fun afterwards. So at the time you're like not really having fun because you're cold, you're wet, you're getting bug bitten. But then some time goes by after this type two fun event happens and you think you laugh about it, you talk about it and you you create these memories. And next thing you know, you're planning another one of these ventures. Yes. Adventures. I, I had a friend explain it to me years ago before I ever heard the term type two fun. He said, it's fun afterwards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say that, you know, the harder the trip is, the longer of a period of time it takes to be fun. And so now that you're editing this stuff, is this is this becoming more fun now than it was at the time? Yeah, I don't know if if it necessarily takes longer to for it to be fun mm-hmm. after the fact, if it's a longer or harder trip. Like mm. I I felt like it was fun like pretty almost immediately afterwards. I think mm. by the time we got to okay. Shoot Lake, yeah. um I was feeling which we got to Shoot Lake I think 3 days after we were done the Stikine. Right. And I was I was like excited to share the story right. with people because I knew yeah. It was intense and crazy and wild and mm-hmm. cool, you know? And mm-hmm. so I felt like I, I had the bragging rights. I could mm-hmm. I could talk about it now and I felt okay about it now that I know we're all okay. And mm-hmm. and and also looking back, even especially watching the footage, looking back, I'm like, we were never ever in d- danger. Like there was no like risk of hypothermia. Like sure, we were cold and maybe uncomfortable and wet, but even at the worst of times, we were never really in like a life threatening danger by any means. And we had the option to be able to get call a jet boat. Now, if yeah. something happens quickly and, and, you know, that won't come fast enough, but yeah. we could have gotten a jet boat to pick us up even at the very beginning of the trip, mm-hmm. realistically, probably within eight hours at the moment, like within a day. Yes. Um, so we were on a river that uh, at the base of it, there was a town in Alaska at the mouth of the river. And we had a couple jet boat captains on our inReach satellite text- texting devices that if we got into trouble, we could get a pickup. Yeah. Um, which, so, which was why we picked this river to begin right, with, because right. it's always important to have an 
you know, escape mm-hmm. route plan or like mm-hmm. evacuation plan. And that mm-hmm. was our plan was jet boat. And so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I should, I should clarify, I should clarify about the <laughs> not enjoying it thing. Okay. I, I didn't even know that you, <laughs> I, I didn't even know that you didn't even having fun. Okay. So you know what I that love? That was news to me. <laughs> I thought you were having fun out there. Okay, so and this, you're riddled with anxiety. Okay, so this is what I should explain to you because I do really enjoy. I obviously enjoy going out there um, because otherwise, why would I do it? I'm not just doing it for the street cred. Maybe mm-hmm. I am. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. But um, I like being <laughs> in these remote areas. Uh, you know beautiful areas challenging to get to areas Mm -hmm. um i love camping Mm -hmm. i like staying in the tent i like being around the campfire i like just being out there in nature with my family Mm -hmm. um and like being there in the moment because there's nothing else there's no distractions aside from just like where you are and and what you're currently doing you know like it's all basic your Mm -hmm. basic needs is all you need to worry about food shelter water like that's it warmth and so i like that Mm -hmm. i think maybe what i what's what stresses me out is is getting from point a to b which is the canoe tripping portion of it Mm -hmm. (laughs) because putting my kids into a small boat in you know cold on cold water essentially mm-hmm. and in like a fairly swift current um that's scary to me so let's just just uh, whose idea was doing the sticking again it was mine yeah so it just what well, was your idea so yeah no yeah. i have never denied that I, it was I'm my just, idea just, from the it, beginning for completely unrelated reason i just was i forgot so i was just you just wanted to idea you just wanted was. to yeah. a quick reminder right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so anyway so the anxiety of making sure every night when we get to camp like the anxiety of like getting to camp mm-hmm. i know once we're at camp it's good you right. know like sure i'm afraid of bears a little bit but like we we have like the odds are so slim of a bear ever you know being aggressive mm-hmm. you know enough to mm-hmm cause us any harm um but but yeah it's really the dangers of dumping the kids being not you know drowning or freezing to death well you know what mm -hmm. so tripping with the kids Mm -hmm. makes the thought of or just like physically doing my own canoe trips by myself or me and you just seem like why was i ever what was i ever afraid of doing a trip (laughs) without kids it's true because yeah you're you're so uh, the way i look at it it's like and, and you know, what, what, what's the difference once we started doing these adventures with our kids, mm-hmm. what do you think changed? So my, my concerns about myself mm-hmm. are not even relevant anymore. Mm-hmm. Like I used to be like, Oh, I'm going to be cold when I get to camp or I'm going to like, my socks are wet. Mm-hmm. None of that matters. Cause I know, okay, my socks are wet. My feet are wet. Who cares? Like I'm right. fine. Like, so right. I'm a little uncomfortable. But if I know my kids' socks are wet, yeah. specifically Wesley, because, you know, Huddy will tell me that he's upset or mm-hmm. uncomfortable. Wesley is like zero, goes from zero to a hundred. Like he's not, he can't be like, oh, my socks are wet. Mm-hmm. And then I can change him. It's like, he's happy, 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 fine, fine, fine. And then he's crying because mm-hmm. he doesn't know how else to communicate to us that his socks are wet mm-hmm. or whatever. Right. So I think the major difference is just constantly being concerned about the the kids, more specifically Wesley, mm-hmm. like I said, because yeah, and, I want to make sure they're comfortable and that they're mm-hmm. safe. Again, Hudson will tell me now mm-hmm. he's at the point where he can say, I'm hungry. I want my diaper changed, whatever. Wesley can't. So mm-hmm. I'm very on edge about needing to check Wesley, need to check his toes, need to check his hands, need to check his diaper be- mm-hmm. and like just check his core temperature because I'm just... I'm constantly worried about him. And I just Mm -hmm. realize now that all of my concerns that I had before I was tripping with kids seem so minuscule and like irrelevant. I I honestly feel the same way. And of course, Wesley has a rare uh, syndrome called Fox G1 syndrome, and he's five years old now. And we've been taking Wesley on these adventures ever since he was younger. And I I do see that they're they're good for him and, and his development. Um, but you know, in part because of Wesley's challenges and just the realities of doing these trips with kids, 
Um, like I even remember the first one we went on when we brought Hudson, when we brought Wesley when he was young and we were planning on putting in to a lake, paddling down this long bay and doing two portages to get into this like backcountry trout lake, yeah. thinking that that was just going to be no problem. Yeah. We didn't even make it down the bay. We made it to like the first island yeah. and the kid was screen was crying. Four kilometers. And yeah, we made it four kilometers. The kid was screen crying, pulled over. It was early, like fairly soon after ISO. Nobody was around. And I remember thinking, oh man, we're not making it and being kind of like bummed out. And oh, like, you know, I had this vision of what the trip would look like in my mind. And now it's like a fraction of that. And then I remember having the best time ever. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, I remember just, okay, pulling back on my expectations and having to roll with the punches with the kids, but also just making some amazing memories too. Yeah. And I, I think that some of the memories we're kind of making, it's even hard to really realize them right away until some time goes by and realize like these amazing things that we've done with our kids. I mean, sometimes you get bad weather like on the Stikine, like we got yeah. hammered with horrific weather and there's nothing you can do about that except stay prepared and, and have the abilities that we have. But even then sometimes things don't go as, as planned. And that's why you need a safety net. Um, do you want to tell the story about what happened on uh, day two of our adventure? Um, on the Stikine? Well, I guess technically and day also one. the Stikine too. Like I think what people don't realize is how, pretty sure there's a safety net with a jet pool, but it's remote like it we're is. talking about northern bc and and southeast alaska like mm -hmm. there's no road access anywhere for you know hundreds and hundreds of miles mm -hmm. along this remote mountain river yes but yeah tell tell the story about what it, happened on it the, certainly uh, is the wilderness um yeah. you know and when we say there's jet boat access, like it took six, probably seven hours to get from Wrangell back to our vehicle by jet boat. So like, think about if we were halfway along the river in mm -hmm. the middle from either end, it would take at least three to four hours for someone to come pick us up. It's not yeah. like, you know, we can call 911 and like the, the right. ambulance. There is, is no 911 yeah. there. And then also, what if that jet boat captain, it's not like he's sitting there idling. Right. He might be he's drunk busy. at the bar, you right. know what I mean? Yeah. Or something like Well, even know. at, well, I don't want to give away too much, but mm -hmm. uh, even at the end of mm -hmm. our trip, we, we did end up calling a jet boat shuttle mm -hmm. just uh, to pick us up a little bit earlier than we expected. Well, we didn't. It was too choppy. To, which was to which is fine. Safety. We chose safety first um, mm -hmm. over, you know, just having the bragging rights of completing the river, mm -hmm. I suppose. <laughs> but anyways, we did call the jet boat um, and he had he said, oh, I'll be there in four hours. Mm -hmm. And we were like 20 kilometers from Wrangell. Yeah, and he's so got other stuff. To he's do. he's on a job already. So mm -hmm. luckily we weren't in you know danger we were pulled you're still over. It was fine you got to be self-sufficient but yes to a large yeah extent. we could get ourselves warm yeah. and we could wait it out it was no problem but like you know don't let it make a false sense of security i think is kind of what right. we're trying to yeah. say yeah yeah absolutely okay yeah. good yeah. like people think that they can just anyways i don't i i just remember hearing a story about when we were doing the mountain river and yeah. people got you know it's a it's a float plane access um river so people get dropped off paying thousands of dollars to be guided down this trip and they get like two days in and they decide they don't want to do it anymore mm -hmm. and so they call a helicopter evacuation at which probably cost them ten thousand dollars yeah of course they're paying for it but it's like there's mm -hmm. better there's better use for these resources like you mm -hmm. can't just oh i don't feel like doing this anymore mm -hmm. like you the whole point is sticking it out toughing it out and mm -hmm. like building some you know r resilience and and character mm -hmm. you know yeah. <laughs> like anyway so you were asking me to tell about day one technically of our trip i i really like having this interview with you honey i feel like uh i, I know it's have because a good chat with you like we never get too much time to just chat you know i know but also it's because you actually have to listen to me <laughs> <laughs> do i not listen to you i'm just kidding okay good i'm sure i um, could work on listening um yeah so it's okay tell Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So okay. how, how did that, f so tell what happened, but I want to hear, cause we okay, haven't so even start... fully talked about this. So I want to hear that, how that so made this you is, feel. Like, so I was, was already nervous. So like we, we drove the, um, Telegraph Creek road in, which mm -hmm. was already t enough of an adventure for me. I could have probably turned around and gone home after that and been like, that was a great adventure because mm -hmm. the road was extremely terrifying, even though people drive in and out of there every day. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was terrifying, just sheer cliffs. Some most there's like, parts where only one vehicle can fit 
twenty percent right, gradient. Twenty <laughs> percent. Like you see those the hills, it's like eight percent, and you're kind of like, oh, this is pretty steep. Twenty yeah, percent. Yeah. So, anyways, terrifying. Plus a trailer. We're towing mm-hmm. a trailer. Mm-hmm. Anyways, we the truck handled it no problem. But um, so anyways, we get to the to Telegraph Creek after driving this terrifying road, like you know, uh, white knuckle the whole time, and. Uh, we had met a couple there who, uh, I guess, follow our adventures and invited us by and we chatted with them and they explained that, well, where they are, they're in the rain shadow. So it was pretty dry at that that time. It was really mm-hmm. beautiful, sunny, warm. And uh, they're like, oh, but the weather's changing. It's it's calling for rain for the next 10 days or something like that. And I'm thinking, okay, well, like, what are the odds that it actually rains for like 10 in days? in the whole region. Yeah. Whenever we're traveling, you know, miles yeah. every mile, so miles like, every day. I didn't think, I was like all right, we might have a few days of rain, which we Mm -hmm. expected because we are going to the rainforest. So Mm -hmm. then, um, anyway, so we get on the river. The day one was a beautiful, beautiful day. We're paddling, you know, um, running a lot of, of rapids, like class one rapids that, Mm -hmm. um, they were all fun and nice. And, uh, anyways, we actually came across that same couple halfway down the river because they had gotten into their boat and, Mm -hmm. uh, went out to have lunch, uh, along the river. And this is just something that they get to do often, just boat the stickeen and just, yeah, just anyways, pretty cool. Um, so anyways, we, we chat with them for a little bit and they're like, oh, we decided to come out and have a nice lunch on the river because this is probably going to be the last one of the season. Yeah. And we're like, okay, like, you know, why? Oh, well, because there's a system coming in and he kind of is explaining how the wind is going to blow in this new system and it's going to be rainy and basically the rain shadow that they're in like switches. So now they're no longer in the rain shadow and it's just going to be really rainy, I guess, for them. So I'm thinking, well, we're paddling away from them. Maybe we'll be like on the other side now of the rain shadow. That would have been nice. I I mean, that didn't happen. (laughs) So anyway, so it was kind of this ominous, like, um, uh, what's foreshadow of what's to Mm -hmm. come. He's like, oh, this wind is going to bring in this new system. And anyway, so get to camp, uh, set up camp. And because we knew it was going to rain the next day, Jim set up a tarp. I set up the tent kind of like, uh, I want to say half acidly because I'm, I'm like, you know, whatever. I, I staked it out a little bit. Uh, after we eat dinner, we're kind of just hanging out under the tarp. It's dark out. And all of a sudden just the wind picks up, um, howling wind, like rips one of the pegs out of the tarp. And I look over and the tent is almost flying away. If it would have, if I hadn't whipped all our stuff inside of it. So anyways, um, we, Jim and I immediately run over, uh, we run over and start, you know, pegging it out better. You're collecting boulders and sticks and, and guying it all out. Mm -hmm. Um, Hudson scream crying because while the tarp is flapping and the wind is blowing, it's terrifying for a two year old. He doesn't know what's happening. And we're kind of panicking. That was, Um, that was terrifying. Well, it was just like, I knew we were going to be okay, but I was so dialed in on like that tent not blowing away. And I was watching the pole. The tent looked like it was flat. Collapsing. Yeah. Like if we had a bad tent and if yeah. we had a high end tent, it just would have snapped the poles or and shredded. just crushed down. And then, yeah, yeah then shredded yeah. on the broken ends of the poles. Yeah. 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 So that was our, our first thought was like, we'll stop the tent from blowing away or shredding or collapsing mm. or whatever. Um, I'm trying to console Hudson who was crying. And then Wesley didn't seem to care uh, in the moment. Hmm. So unless he's a seasoned vet. Yeah. He's just like, ah, no, this is nothing. But, um, <laughs> you know, luckily we were, we were camped in a spot where there was like no trees around us. So I wasn't worried about like trees falling down on us. Anyways, get the tree, uh, get the tent all guide out. Um, I get in the tent with the kids, calm them down. Mm-hmm. They go to sleep. Um, I think we got out of the tent, ate the, the fish that you were in the middle of cooking when the wind blew up. Yeah. Anyways. So the wind died uh, right after we were finished guying out the tent, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and we go to bed. The next morning we wake up. You get out of the tent first, mm-hmm. you, which is usual because I stay in the tent and I get the ki- everything packed up and get the kids ready. And you go get the food barrels and start breakfast. You get out of the tent. And I think it took you a minute to realize <laughs> that the canoe was no longer there. <laughs> what did I say? I don't remember. I was just in the tent. I hear you go. Oh no. And I could just picture you with like your hands on your head. And I'm like, what, what? Like The canoe is gone. I'm like, no. Oh God. I'm getting PTSD remembering this. Yeah. So I, um, 
Anyways, I'm like, no. So I like this unzip the tent because uh, I mean, not that I didn't believe you, but I go and I look and sure enough, the canoe was gone. And so we were camped on kind of the outflow of this little creek where it met the stakeen. And so the direction that the wind was blowing, it would have blown the canoe directly into that little creek yeah. and and taken it down river. And if we weren't despite, on that creek, it probably yeah. would have just blown into the trees, right. uh, into the forest or whatever yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But no, just blew it right. And that's what we're assuming happened. Blew it into the creek How and it was it. gone. Yeah, and I did have the painter of the canoe tied around a boulder. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, like a rock, but I guess it, the rock wasn't deep enough sunken into the sand, and it just, the the uh, rope just pulled yeah. under the boulder. Because if you think about it, gale force wind with it ripping the under. Well, and the canoe just acts like a sail. Yeah. It's a gigantic sail. And the canoe, mm -hmm. even though it's 18 feet, it's only like 75, 80 pounds, yeah. maybe. So how did you feel? Like, what... What was the emotion that went through your uh, your mind when you heard me say, the canoe's gone? Um, I initially, um, part of me was like, as weird as this might sound, a part of me was a little relieved because I'm like, oh, yes, we don't have to do this forever. We can go home. <laughs> Why? Because after have the windstorm, you were just like terrified, terrified and didn't want to continue. Well, not, e not only after the windstorm, but after all the rapids we had run the day before, I was like, this is, I'm terrified. This is way more intense than I was expecting on the Stikine. I thought, mm -hmm. I knew it was swift current, but like, I was just like, oh no, what have we signed ourselves up for? So part, there was a part of me that was feeling a little bit. Yeah sense of relief like there's our excuse now we can go home because mm -hmm. i was like well we're like 10 kilometers from um what's the town at the end of the road glenora, glenora yeah i was like which well, is just no, call it's a tiny town with yeah a few but, people, but, but we still had our friends could have just come down in their yeah. boat and got us we were mm -hmm. literally like two kilometers from where we had bumped into them mm -hmm. the day before mm -hmm. so we would have just in reached them mm -hmm. and hung out there we had 10 days worth of food and a tent and our, all of our stuff i was like oh, i'll camp here for a little bit longer <laughs> it's fine <laughs> right right um yeah, but so probably... a part of me was relieved and then of but, course to remember the rapid the hardest rapids of the whole trip were up river yeah and they weren't even they were like class ones if that like yeah. we avoided everything yeah. but again With you know as kids. people that bomb class threes and dump sometimes woo, that was fun right yeah. just with the kids the excitement and the, the fear was like amped way up and we just avoided everything barely even hit one wave because we were yes. too scared I know, like anything that anything on that river, you and I would have just not even scouted mm. if it was just the two right. of us. We and you just... could start from Glenora as opposed to Telegraph Creek and yeah. just skip all of that. Yeah. But we decided to start from the top. Yeah, we wanted a little mm. bit more excitement, apparently. Just paddling mm. the stikine wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that was an option until after. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so a part of me was relieved, um, but I was I was really disappointed because I was mm -hmm. like, we literally just drove eleven days across the entire country to paddle this river mm. we weren't of course the road trip is a great part of it and was all fun and part of the adventure but mm. the the sole purpose of doing that drive and that road trip was to paddle this river mm. so i was like if we just drove all that way and have to drive back mm -hmm. um and we didn't even make it you know one day out here like that's really 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 crappy um so yeah, I was disappointed for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I was also like, nah, we'll get it back. It's kind of, I just felt mm -hmm. like, oh, it's just really a, an inconvenience that now we have to spend the day looking for it or whatever, and maybe looking, put us a day behind yeah. and it's going to be really hard for Jim to have to go get it. Cause I get to hang out with the kids at camp, mm -hmm. but I was like, oh, we'll get it back either. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll call. Cause I was thinking if we do call somebody to like get us out of there, we're obviously going to go look for the canoe with mm -hmm. them because right. We we're, we're we're not just going to leave the canoe. You're obviously going to go and look for it a little bit at least, because maybe it's just a couple kilometers down river. Mm -hmm. So if we were to call our friends, they were to come get us. I'm sure we would have gone to look for the canoe, anyways. Right. Even if even if we were planning on calling them to get us out of there, yeah. like we wouldn't have just wanted to leave this canoe floating around in, in northern BC without yeah. trying to look for it. So yeah. Um, that's yeah. So point. that was my thought. I was like, oh, we'll find it either. We'll find it and then get out of here or 
we'll find it and keep going. I don't mm-hmm. know. That's kind of what I thought. Yeah, which is yeah, I'm about right. I was just kind of embarrassed because I'm supposed to know so much about canoeing. I've been doing remote wilderness trips for 18 years. And so what do you do every single night? You tie your canoe up as if it's going to be a once in a lifetime windstorm because that's what it was. I, two locals. One guy said once in 50 years windstorm. The other people said once in a lifetime. There's trees snapped in half all yeah. over the place did damage to property you name it so i mean maybe the answer is yes you tie your canoe up it, every yeah. day like it's a once in a lifetime windstorm especially when you're in an area that remote with your kids <laughs> but with or your kids are not well you know, so sure, lessons learned you know i'm sure a lot of people avid mm-hmm. canoeists would probably say yeah yeah. Pull it way up, tie it up mm-hmm. every time. But then at the same time, is it like saying like, oh, geez, I'm I'm an idiot because I didn't weld reinforcement steel in my car roof and a tornado knocked a tree down on it and smashed my smashed my car. Is that their fault, too? You know what I mean? Like sometimes I mean, there's reach, these acts of yes. nature that are yeah. really I know extreme. What you mean. I know you what know? you mean, of course. But mm. I think just in the canoeing world it is you know best practice to just haul your canoe up and tie it off to which something. we did but just not well enough which you and i usually do in but general we didn't tie it up especially well on a river enough. yeah and we Anyways. didn't haul it up and i guess we hauled up far enough but it blew into a creek yeah. and then washed into it was the river. it was just like a, a lot of perf it was a perfect storm yeah, literally a like perfect storm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe we shouldn't give much more away about this because yeah. we'll let people jump over to our YouTube series that you're working on so mm-hmm. hard editing and they can see what the rest of the story is about the canoe. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about just like your well, I want to talk to you about paddle like a girl. OK, but first I want to ask you a little bit more about uh your experience growing up um were you involved in the outdoors were you excited about going the outdoors uh as a kid or is that sort of something that that happened later in life and i guess could you kind of go back and tell me a time let's say when you were a kid or a teenager and you thought about camping or thought about the outdoors or thought about adventures Mm -hmm. and travel is that ever something that kind of spurred your interest yeah. So, so actually I, I didn't really grow up, uh, camping or mm-hmm. outdoors at all. Really. Mm-hmm. I was always like into sports and like, mm-hmm. I would love going bike riding and mm-hmm. rollerblading and all of that stuff, which, you right. know, whatever. But, um, some of my fondest or my fondest memories as a child is actually the, um, when I went, my mom took us to Algonquin park. I think it was mm-hmm. just, it was just drive up. Yeah. It was definitely yeah. just drive up, but Regardless, it's one of my, uh, like, it's a memory that really sticks out in my mind because I remember seeing a moose. Cool. We, we did go canoeing and I remember seeing a moose and the moose was peeing for, <laughs> and I remember that very vividly because it was just like, really the, uh, the it was very aggressive. Like the pee sound, it was so loud cool. and it was so long. I was like, how long, how much piss does this moose have? I have a pissed animal story too as a child. Really? At the, mine was at African Lion Safari. Okay. So, which is like a zoo that you yes. drive around in. And there was a rhino peeing and the rhino was peeing so much that it was creating like a, a canyon. Right. Rushing away from its, you know, yeah. the, from the base of its pecker. Yeah. And I even ever since then, I, you know, whenever I, somebody, my brother was taking a huge piss, I'd say, what are you, a rhino? Because we were both there and it's been like a run on joke for the last 35 years well there you go yeah, so but i hadn't heard this piss story that's a very continue please. yeah i mean yeah i don't know maybe i made this up in my mind because um but that's just a vivid memory for me is like coming around paddling and coming around a corner and there just being this moose there and it peeing mm-hmm. i don't know anyways that's a memory that i have um another memory from that uh trip is a chipmunk i guess the animals were pretty tame at this point but a chipmunk i got him to climb all the way up my arm and onto my head because i was feeding it like peanuts or whatever and so Uh that was another memory um but yeah so i mean obviously those are positive memories for me Mm -hmm. from my uh, childhood and Mm so um and i do remember always being very jealous of kids who had cottages yeah i remember just being so jealous that like Every time summer would roll around, they're gone all summer because they would just go to their family cottage. And I just I would get invited to like one of my friends had a really nice cottage um, 
And so I would, I would get to go up there for like a week or something like that. But just, I just always remember being so jealous and also camp, like going to summer camp was always something that I was so jealous of people got to go to because Mm -hmm. for grade eight, we had, um, we did go to a summer camp for like a couple nights as our grade eight, um, like graduation Mm -hmm. thing. Um, so I loved it. I just, it was so much fun because there's all the outdoor activities, all the sports like rock climbing and like canoeing and whatever else we did. But I just remember being always so jealous of the kids who got to go you do know, that stuff. I like, I like summer camp. I went to a sports camp. I wish I, I did one camp where we did day trips canoeing just in Muskoka, but I honestly, there was too many rules because my family, I was lucky enough that my grandfather and dad built a cottage mm-hmm. in the sixties and I kind of got to do all these things. It was a water access cottage too. Or, or camp or, or cabin, wherever you happen to be, they call them different things. But uh, I remember going to camp and being like getting in trouble and there was just like too many rules. And I felt like I could just, I knew how to drive all these boats. Like, why did I have to wait in line to like let a camp counselor drive them? And then like the camp counselors were like mean Gen Xers and cynical, you know what I mean? <laughs> With like rock band shirts and shit, you know? Yeah. And, Anyways, whatever. I still thought it was awesome, but I never, I, I, I think it would be cool to send our kids to like one of those canoe tripping camps where they I think really so. get into the back country. And yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think, uh, um, I never would have expected myself to get to a point where I'm doing the trips that I'm doing now. And, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I think it was always just a part of what I enjoyed doing mm-hmm. and, um, now that I'm into it, even I still have imposter syndrome, even though I've done all these epic trips, I still mm-hmm. am like, so if I meet someone else who's into the outdoors or into canoeing or whatever, and we chat about like, oh, you know, I used to do this, or I was once an instructor, you know, I immediately like, oh, they're way better than me. And they've done way, they're way more hardcore. They've done way more trips. Of, like this, this is just the imposter syndrome I don't know. where I, I just don't, are... I don't take I don't take the credit where I I should because I'm assuming, well, just because I didn't grow up doing it, I'm not Mm -hmm. as good or experienced or knowledgeable as the people who had a a cottage and were always outside playing in the dirt and exploring nature or whatever. First of all, a lot of people with cottagers didn't do cottages. Don't do what my, it was just like fun in the sun. My family was, uh, we, first of all, where our camp was or cottage was in an area with a ton of public land and backcountry lakes. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, bushwhacking on compass bearings and fishing and visiting these remote lakes we'd always try to visit them and then we started camping them as kids like without our parents from a young age portaging people don't typically do that kind of stuff no i know I right know. so yeah. uh, that's where i kind of learn my my side of the things but yeah. so it was and by the way you are i just look at your paddle stroke it's very good it's very beautiful very strong looks looks perfect and i think that I know, I guess you started getting into this mainly once you started dating me. Mm-hmm. I always wanted a, a girl that was down for this stuff because I knew I would be doing it so much that I would never see my significant other if they weren't. Mm-hmm. So just the fact that you were excited about it excited me. And um, once we started doing it together, I started thinking, I think Tori likes this stuff more than I do. <laughs> Like, remember that trip we did across Algonquin Park and I left the fishing rod on like the upper pedal wall wall, like three portages and I had to do a 4K bushwhack to find our last fishing rod. Yeah. And then I fell and like damaged yeah. the crap out of my leg, leg yeah. on the way there. And it was almost dark. I remember getting back after that being like, this is just a shit show. I'm injured. I'm bleeding. I'm swarmed by bugs and exhausted. And you're just like having so much fun. I'm like, I think she, I really think she likes this more than me and you learn something so fast right it's not there's people that can be doing stuff all their life but the accumulated hours that you learn plus you started dating me who and then married me thank god and i you know i already had a ton of experience i could just give you Mm -hmm. right you know so just because you didn't do it since when you're a kid doesn't mean that you can't learn all the things you need to learn quicker um especially now uh, like you know, you can learn things way faster nowadays because of the internet too than you could back in the 80s in the pre-internet days. Mm-hmm. It could take you 18 years to learn something you can learn in five years nowadays. So I think you just kind of became immersed in it. 
you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. my, that's my experience from. Yeah. From but it's also here. because, um, admittedly, this isn't really the healthiest reason, but, um, I'm also extremely competitive. <laughs> and so I am like, I want to be yeah. the best right. at whatever it is that like mainly with like, mm-hmm. uh, sport. Mm-hmm. I, I want to be really good at it and I'm competitive and like, I'm not like, a, well, sometimes I'm a sore loser, but when I, when I see somebody that I think is like really cool or really good at something, like I want to be like, I want to be, I'm like, I want to be as good as them, you know, mm-hmm. like hey, they're doing this. I want to, I can do that too. You know? Mm-hmm. So I think with canoeing, um, you know, I don't, I want to do it properly and, and mm-hmm. well, I don't want to just be, you know, lily dipping out there you know so yeah, especially yeah. with you in the start like you're always screaming at me so i just don't have a choice <laughs> paddle hard well that's because we're running like intense rapids exactly yeah like the east natashquan and natashquan remember some of those rapids we ran out there i do good I lord do. yeah oh, i think we were the first people to ever even get video footage of that waterfall. epic waterfall in the east natashquan yeah. man that was mind-blowing yeah so cool i want to go back I don't remember that being a particularly nice day. It was like hammering rain and bugs. That was also a really not nice weather trip, no. as well as the porcupine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What the nice you... weather trip was the Rockies and the oh, mountain river. Oh, yes. Yeah. The mountain was, was abnormally too hot. Nice. It was 30 degrees at 11 p.m. in the right. ro- on the mountain river. Remember that? Yeah. And we were camped on a gravel bar with zero shade. Yeah. Yeah. That was crazy. And we were at pretty high elevation. Well, no, we were close to the Mackenzie, but still, we were fairly high elevation and in the Northwest Territories, like well north of 60 yeah. for it, it to be that so hot. so weird. But anyways, yeah. so beautiful. So what happened when, um, oh man, I could talk about this with that with you all day, but I, I want to talk about like your paddle like a girl. Okay. Because that was something that you really, I remember we used to live, you know, down south and you were doing photography for CrossFit for this CrossFit gym and you were kind of doing a barter with them where they'd let you work out for free. And I remember when we moved up North, I felt really bad, kind of like I was taking you away from that. Like you had this cool thing going and uh, just of your own free will, despite the fact that we'd just gone through like what I felt was traumatizing experience, a traumatizing experience and really bad news, getting our son Wesley's diagnosis and being told that, there's a good chance he'll never be able to learn how to walk and never learn how to talk. And that not long after that and moving here, you kind of found a whole other thing that really took off in Mm -hmm. an exciting way. What was it? What was it that, uh, that sort of inspired you to do that, to start paddle like a girl? So, um, so the main thing I think Mm -hmm. is that I've always been extremely, um, independent and I like to feel capable and um strong and like I, I can do it I don't need I don't need no man like that kind of thing you know what I mean nice so going from being that person and then mm. like having a kid um first of all becoming a mom just changes you so much because well now um like you have this small baby who's 100% dependent on you but you're also your life is revolving around them and their needs right so I felt like kind of a loss of like identity right like right. you just you, you who am I I'm just I'm a mom now like that's just what I am and then everything else comes second okay so so then we um we're going through the diagnosis with Wesley so yeah. now not only was like you know, kind of my world had just had all these major life changes. You know, we got married mm-hmm. and immediately got pregnant and then moved far away from my friends and family. Like we moved two and a half hours north of where I grew up and where everyone I know is. Mm-hmm. So now we're somewhere new um, and I'm a new mom because we moved up here a month before I gave birth to Wesley. Yeah. So which is isolating in itself when you're a new mom let alone physically being isolated from everybody and everything mm-hmm. and then uh, we start realizing he's delayed and then we start going through the testing. And so it was just like a year from hell. Mm-hmm. Like it was like, I can't anyway. So, um, so uh, what happened? So we're going through testing, testing, testing. And the whole year, January to basically October was full of like pretty intense testing with Wesley mm-hmm. physio OT, different doctor's appointments, specialists going down to sick kids, like three and a half hour drive from Mm -hmm. here just for appointments to get no information. 
And then a friend of mine invited me um, on a solo canoe trip. Mm -hmm. So by solo means we each were going to be soloing our own canoes. Um, Obviously, we would kind of have each other there as companions, but we were totally in charge of our own outfit and we didn't have to kind of worry about each other as much we were just Mm -hmm. there to you know morale boosters basically where did you go again so we did a five-day trip through algonquin so we started at um i think smoke lake and then um finished in rock Mm -hmm. lake so there was like a three kilometer portage in there there was um you know a bear scare in there like there it was a pretty good it was a pretty intense trip for my Mm -hmm. it was my first time going without you Mm -hmm. um and like just soloing a canoe like i mean i've soloed a canoe before obviously but um my first time going on an overnight canoe trip without you who was like the person who i relied on to do a lot of the tasks around camp so Mm -hmm. um anyway so in the in the midst or like kind of near the end of our testing or diagnosis um journey i guess i'll say i went on this trip with kobe um we still hadn't received a diagnosis. This was before we received his diagnosis, but after he had started having seizures. Mm -hmm. So, um, I went on that trip with her and it was just like everything I needed. Like it reminded me that, um, you know, I can still go on trips like this. I can still do, do things like this physically. Um, and I'm not just a mom, like I do have this identity as like a canoeist and outdoors person. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just kind of changed my perspective. And also just in general, it was what I needed. Like emotionally, I just needed a break from Mm -hmm. being constantly stressed out about Mm -hmm. what this diagnosis is, because like, think about it, you're waiting every day, like, uh, you know, on tenter hooks, is that the word tenter hooks to get a phone call? That's going to change your life. Like, Oh, Wesley, might never walk again we still didn't know so you Mm -hmm. just every day you just feel sick to your stomach crazy time anytime the phone would ring i just felt like puking you know and so um going on this trip i just like got to totally check out you know like Mm -hmm. i'm in the moment and need to get us from point a to b need to again you know food shelter water warmth whatever that's all i needed to worry about i didn't need to think about a diagnosis or a phone call coming in or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, and you dealt with some kind of scary occurrences on that trip too. Yeah. 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 Did. How did, uh, how did that, uh, did that dealing with those occurrences um, help you sort yes, of for sure. gain confidence or how, how did they make you feel or, or react moving? Well, it's just the- funny. Cause when you're like, when you're out there and you're, mm-hmm. you're in the wilderness, um, you know, and you're totally reliant on just the gear that you have with you mm-hmm. and and you are responsible for getting yourself out of there or like to safety or whatever it is. You kind of realize that, well, when I'm back at home mm-hmm. with the luxuries and, and comforts of like our house and the roof over our head and the electricity and running water and all of those things, I'm like, nothing is really that hard anymore. Right. You know, like you know, if I want to drink water while I'm out there, well, I need to make sure it's treated or I'm boiling it or whatever so that I'm not going to get dirty. I get sick. Well, you know, if it's pouring rain, I need to make sure I can set up a shelter mm-hmm. and I can get warm and I can be safe. If it's windy, I need to make sure I can get my, you know, canoe to where I need to go for safety, whatever. It's just, you're, you're very like worrying about your own safety and, and um comforts whereas when you're at home it's like well i've got this big comfortable bed and my blankets and the the lights are on and i can get a fire going in the wood stove like it's just everything just seems so much more simple and and yeah. easy and i'm like what was i ever worried about being at home like nothing's really that hard because mm-hmm. i can always just go inside my house you mm-hmm. know and so when i th- would think about the challenges with wesley um i was kind of feeling like well, you know, we'll be okay. We have, we, we are blessed to have, you know, this home and all the resources that we've discovered we have right Mm -hmm. here because we do, we have so many resources, probably more than we would get in the city because the wait lists are probably so long, but you know, it just kind of puts everything into perspective that, well, maybe if I can handle this out here, then how hard could it possibly be at home in the comforts of of my own home, you know? Wow. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. So it gave you sort of, uh, 
a, a different perspective on on everything i guess happening in your life all the challenges happening in your yeah. life at that time yeah and then how did that make you want to start paddle like a girl yeah so yeah i didn't really know what i wanted to do at first but um when i went on that trip i was still on maternity leave and so mm-hmm. i had a few months before i had to figure out well what am i going to do for work uh once my mat leave ends um and so after going on that trip and actually before that trip i had had right after wesley had his first seizures i had had the opportunity to go out west and be part of this novacraft um commercial yeah. for export development canada so um, I got to go out there and they had actually brought me in because Novacraft knew me um, and they recommended me as like s- someone who knows what they're doing out there because they had hired other people to obviously to also be in the canoes with us. So they hired myself and another girl that Novacraft knew. And so when I went out there, um, I was paddling stern, mm-hmm. which I didn't normally do. So I really had to get up on my my sterning skills quick because mm-hmm. I wanted to, I'm like, I'm going to be on like this is a serious shoot and I want to mm. look like I know what the hell I'm doing yeah. out there. So I like yeah. immediately was like, I got to really amp up my skill. And so, and so that amped up my, um, sterning skills. And then after that, um, I went on that solo trip. So anyways, so, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And because I was so like kind of em- empowered after this trip with Kobe, I was like, I, I want to share this with other women specifically because I'm thinking, you know, everybody has got their own stuff that they're going through, their own stresses, whatever, you know? So, um, and it's all relative. So Mm -hmm. just, um, after being a mom and then becoming this, you know, mother to a child with special needs, I was like, how can I share this empowering, uh, experience with other women? So I started thinking, well, maybe I'll, um, guide trips, but then I'm like, well, I don't have all the gear I need to guide trips. I don't have all the certs I need, blah, blah, blah. So I was, I wasn't really prepared or willing to put in the work to guide trips. And I wasn't sure if that was what I wanted to do. So I kind of scaled it back and decided instead of guiding, you know, backcountry trips, why don't I just introduce women to, um, what they could do in a canoe. So even though they're just camping on our property, there's a house here. It doesn't seem super appealing to maybe somebody like you who likes to obviously get away from civilization. It is beautiful. It's right it on the river. Beautiful. There's nice exactly. swimming. Like all so that, of cool stuff. so that was my thought process was like, mm. first of all, I'm bringing somewhere some, I'm bringing people somewhere that a, they've never been before because mm-hmm. they've never been to our property before. It is so beautiful, mm-hmm. which is the first comment people usually make when they pull up here. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful here. Um, and it's just, it's not really about getting out into the back country and being in will, uh, like in a wild space. It's more about going, getting outside for the mm-hmm. weekend, being among a group of women who also have similar intentions or enjoy the same thing. They're all here for the same reasons. They want to be outside learn a new skill or hone their skills, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so you get to meet other women, um, who you may eventually go tripping with, which a Mm -hmm. lot of my past participants have made friends with other participants and they've gone on trips since then. Mm -hmm. Um, you get food made for you all weekend, which is pretty Mm -hmm. cool. And it's really just something for you to do, you know, like it's, it's an opportunity to have something for yourself. Like Mm -hmm. that's what I, that's kind of really the only way I can put it because people have asked me, Oh, can I bring my daughter? And maybe one day I'll, I'll consider doing like a mother daughter one. But my initial goal behind it was not so much just about come and learn a skill, which that's the main premise. It's more about women and specifically mothers need, need to have something for themselves. And Mm so, um, you know, it's different than, you know, going away for the weekend to a spa or, you know, going out for dinner with your girlfriends. This is like a full weekend, um, being kind of pretty much immersed in nature because we are getting out, we are paddling, you're camping, you're sleeping in a tent. Mm -hmm. You know, some people who have come to my workshops have never slept in a tent before. Um, and so the, so people come for many different reasons. There's many Mm -hmm. different reasons to come to my workshops and, um, I couldn't have imagined it being, better than it is mm-hmm. like i it it has evolved mm-hmm. over the last four years because i've mm-hmm. done, been doing it for four years now so it has evolved but just seeing mm-hmm. women's faces as they are you know f- 
they're, it's finally clicking how to get that canoe to go straight in the water. Um, or them lifting the canoe up over their head. Um, after they told me, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. And just seeing their smiles at the end of the weekend, they're just like every, they're all friends with each other. They're hugging and they're happy. They feel confident they're empowered. It's, it's more than just learning how to canoe. It's about, um, reminding women that they are strong, that they are capable and just giving them the opportunity to get outside and also hopefully now take the skills that they've learned and now do their own backcountry trips or sign up for that, sign up for that guided trip that they want to go on or just anything like they'll similar to me being out on that trip and realizing, wow, I was able to do this trip. What else can I do? And so that's, kind of my goal like people are like scared to get into a canoe because it looks like this tippy thing that's going to dump and maybe they're they don't want to go for a swim you know so Mm -hmm. if i just help them get into the canoe and realize okay this is it's it's not just going to dump when i look at it or you know i know how to keep it going straight i know how to navigate my way you know through algonquin i can read a map now i can i know what to pack all of these things that maybe seem overwhelming or intimidating when you know nothing about it um, or aren't given the opportunity to learn about it. Um, s- s- there, It's doable now. It's attainable. And so I just, um, yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. A lot of fun? Yeah. Yeah. And how does it make you feel when you learn how to lift that canoe up over your head? Because from what I can see, it's mostly the kind of thing that, you know, the man does, if a, mm-hmm. if a guy goes with his wife or his girlfriend or whatever, um, usually the man's portaging the canoe and probably in a lot of situations, maybe that makes sense. Maybe, you know, men are stronger on average, but I Careful. think that women, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I think that women also don't realize how strong they are. Yes. And I, this comes from anybody yeah. because I've seen, I've gone out on some hardcore trips with my friends, mm-hmm. with friends, um, uh, very, you know, long trips and they've apologized to the rest of the group af- after a few days in because they realized that they weren't carrying enough. Yeah. Um, they saw everyone carrying and they thought, well, this is as much as I could possibly carry flash forward a few days. They're carrying more and more. And they, they, I've had a friend come to me and say, I had no idea I was this strong. Right. Yeah. And that is something that he then carried with him for the rest of his life. Exactly. As just somebody who thinks they're strong. Is that is that something that you see uh people clicking with out there? And, and how do how do you think that makes them feel? How does that make you feel to uh <clears throat> when you realize that you're stronger than you think, but also when you fe- see other people realizing it? Yeah, it's incredible. It's like this is why I'm doing it. Like I Um, It goes back to me just always feeling like uh, I want to do it. Like, I don't need your help. I can do it myself. So like kind of sharing that with other people, um, with other women specifically who don't think that they can do it. Like I've Mm -hmm. had so many people, women say, oh, is it okay if I opt out of lifting the canoe? Because it's intimidating. And so I I give them a, a chance. I'm like, can we just try? We'll be the right there with you. And like, we'll take it off your shoulders if you need to. I just mm-hmm. want you to try just to see what it feels like. And mm-hmm. they do it. And then next thing you know, they're like, Oh, I'll carry the canoe. Mm-hmm. Like I'll, t- I'll bring it down here for you if you want. Like they're so excited wow. too. And then yeah. later on month, a month later, I get a picture of them carrying a canoe because they went mm-hmm. to Algonquin and they're doing the portage. And so I'm um, sure like on average, you know, between you and I, you're bigger and stronger than I am. So it only makes sense because you're going to exert less energy for you to carry the canoe. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. But like, it's not just about what makes the most sense all the time. What if I'm on a trip with you and you get injured Mm -hmm. and I don't know how to carry the canoe? Well, now Mm -hmm. we're both screwed. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, it's only for safety as well. Mm -hmm. Like if not only for safety, Mm -hmm. for the women to, for, for, for you to know how to carry the canoe if you need to. Or, or all the skills to do with canoeing, right? Like that's a lot of my participants are like, well, I usually am tripping with my partner and he's always carrying the canoe. He's always sterning. He's always doing this. So, well, 
just because you're learning this doesn't mean now you're going to take over the role of portaging the canoe on every trip you go on. But in the off chance that a, you want to carry it, you can, and B you have to carry it because they can't, they can't, they've, they've hurt their leg or they've whatever it's, it's good for safety. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess maybe I didn't really answer your question. Your question was, how does it, how do they feel and how does it make me feel? They just feel, I can tell that they're like, holy shit. Can I swear? Holy (laughs) shit. I did that. Like, they're just like, Mm -hmm. and they thank me. Thank you for making, thank you for, you know, uh, empowering me. I don't want to say making me carry the canoe, but they're like, thank you for, for getting me to try that because Mm -hmm. I otherwise, and, and when else are they going to do it? Like, are they sure? Maybe their husband might be like, you carry the canoe, but I've been there and I've had my husband telling me how to do things and you're you, you're, not you're very super, good at, super responsive. at what you do but you're <laughs> but in my defense you know I've seen you explain things or just like this just do it like this just like this you know there's no like step like I've step. I've learned over the past four years how to explain in diff- many different ways because everybody learns differently okay try this all right let's try it this way put your hand here place this here and like so it's it's lear- it's a learned thing for me to teach but also yeah. I don't there's something different about learning from somebody else than your than your significant so other for some I reason. heard you mention that you based this entire business off of women who didn't want to listen to their husbands. I mean, that's I don't know if that's okay to say, but it's a joke. I but know, it's, yeah. <laughs> I know. I, you but know, it, I, it's true. It's like yeah. there's something about you mm-hmm. telling me how to do something versus literally probably anybody else. A cat, even. Yeah. Okay. Hudson, I, whatever. Mm, mm. <laughs> no, Anyways. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. And I, I also think, uh, you know, the, the mansplaining thing a little bit. I don't know if yeah, I'm I've, I've, I've literally witnessed. Means, I've literally witnessed somebody try to teach their significant other how to lift, how to do like the flipping the canoe up onto mm-hmm. their shoulders. And I'm, and I don't want to just step in when I have not been asked to step in. So I just, I'm watching and I'm just thinking about like, they're not changing the way they're explaining it at any point. Mm-hmm. So if they're not, if it's not clicking, when you say this, you need to change the way you're explaining it. And yeah. so I think too, like I remember hearing that uh, Michael Jordan was shooting a commercial for McDonald's and he was supposed to miss a basket and it took him like 33 tries before miss? he missed because it's so dialed in. It's so ingrained. Yeah. And I remember when I was shooting a video on how to lift a canoe, I realized I didn't even know what I was yeah. doing and I yeah. couldn't even explain it yeah. just because it had become so second nature right. to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So somebody that's actually taken the time to think through it and also somebody that might have actually learned it a little later in life that still has that still remembers the steps on how to learn it. Mm-hmm. It's why it's why like the Wayne Gretzky's aren't always the best coaches. People that things kind of came so Comes, naturally yeah. to it's Second oftentimes nature. people that um are are not uh the best right out of the hop that had to put more time into learning things and mm-hmm. become the best coaches uh which is really interesting i also feel like that through explaining that you you in part explain what it means to paddle like a girl could you explain that a little bit more I'm um, just the meaning behind the name, like why I decided. Yeah, like to when you're like when you're explaining to me that uh, it, you know, you realize that uh, you're strong, and you realize that wow, I I can do this. Mm-hmm. That through that is sort of what paddle like a girl means. What it means yeah. to paddle like a girl. And right. I don't know if you could explain what the meaning behind that is, but mm-hmm. it, it seems like it's pretty empowering. Yeah. Well, I mean, I took, I I kind of stole it from um, a commercial that I had seen a while, while back. And it was, um, I think like um, maybe a Tampax commercial or something, but uh, it was basically them asking a group of kids of different age groups. So they started off with young kids, um, you know, I don't know, five or six or something. Mm -hmm. And they would ask them, okay, what does it mean to throw like a girl? And they'd ask boys and girls in the they would all throw as well as they could. I've as seen hard that as they could. It means to throw really, really hard. Yeah, it means the girls to throw. Okay, say. what does it mean to run like a girl? And they would yeah. run really, really hard. And then they'd ask like the next age group. And then by the time they got to the teenagers, mm-hmm. um, they would ask them, what does it mean to throw like a girl? And they would all mimic and throw like really weak, like dainty. What does it mean to run like a girl? And they would all do this silly, like useless run, right? Mm-hmm. So... So society has obviously ingrained that, oh, 
to do something like a girl means to do it not well and 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 very weak <laughs> because women are weak and uh incapable i guess is is mm-hmm. kind of what society has has just naturally taught us i don't know why um but anyways so i i loved that commercial it really it really sat with me because i'm like yeah when did this become an insult to do something like a girl like why is that why are we saying ah you do that like a girl like why would that do you be ever feel insulting that you, to somebody you, that as a woman that you have to do things like a girl s- yes. in order to not yeah. seem too masculine or something like yeah, that? Yeah. So, so that's where I got paddle like a girl from. Cause my idea was like, like I wanted it to be for women. And so I'm like, you know, paddle like a girl just came to mind. And so, and so the what does idea paddle like is, it mean? What the does it mean? idea is paddle like a girl. It means you paddle if efficiently and powerfully and, as capable as anybody else would would paddle basically right so paddle mm-hmm. like a girl like to paddle like a girl means you are a strong powerful paddler it and then you've, you've taken back that power that, yeah that was what, yeah what so was it was robbed. initially like kind yeah. of a bit of a joke mm-hmm. and like there are people who still to this day will see the mm-hmm. name paddle like a girl and just like ha, ha, paddle like a girl and you know, I'm just kind of like, whatever, you can laugh at it if you want. Like, it is obviously a play off of the yeah. what is to be an insult. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, you know, anyways. So, and then, you know, just last summer, I would go paddling with uh, Mary, our our cousin-in-law. Um, and, she, and, you know, I bring the blue steel with me. I had t- tied it to the roof. I take it off the roof. I'm portaging it to the water. The we blue have steel is a canoe. The blue steel, yeah. sorry, it's our 15-foot prospector. Yeah. Um, but, you know, which is the one I solo all the time. So I brought that with us. I take it off the roof, put it in the water. We have our paddles. We have all the stuff we need. We have our fishing gear. Get into the canoe, and we're literally about to paddle away. And this man is there with his kids, and he's sure he's just being nice and polite. But he comes over, and he's like, are, are you two going to be okay? Mm-hmm. But seriously, he's asking. He's concerned for our safety mm-hmm. because I guess because we're women, we couldn't possibly know what we're doing getting mm-hmm. into. And I'm thinking – what about this situation tells you that we are not going to be okay? Like, I know he's just trying to be nice. And I, I, you know, I was like, yeah, we're we're good. Thank you. Um, But you know, it's, it bothered me the rest of the day because I'm like, would he have asked two men? 100% 100% no. What if two men came out here mm-hmm. and did exactly what I had done? Where, where were you, by the way? Um, We were near Ottawa. Um, okay. Caledon. Caledon. So you weren't like in some whitewater river or something. And we not, were on you a were lake. outfitted we were outfitted completely properly for where you were. We had our life jackets, our yeah. paddles. I had ca- carried the canoe on my shoulders, taken it off, put it in the water. Like there was, I, it's not like I was fumbling with stuff and like tripping over myself and dropping the canoe. Like, I'm like thinking, what about this situation? What could I have done differently? Mm-hmm. And and again, sure, he's just con- he it, he's trying to be polite. That's what he's mm-hmm. doing. He's being polite. But in my mind, I'm thinking, would you have asked two men mm-hmm. this question? Would you have asked a man and a woman mm-hmm. this question? But you're just asking because we are two women getting into a canoe. You are assuming that this is our first time ever getting into a canoe mm-hmm. or that we're usually with a man who knows what they're doing. Mm-hmm. That's, that's w- what I took from that. Mm-hmm. And like, sure, maybe I'm jumping to conclusions, yeah. but this is a reason, but you know, sure. But this honest. is the, right. This mm-hmm. is the reason why I, one of the many reasons why I started paddle like a girl, because why is it so weird to see women doing this? Well, that, uh, and, and, you know, to me, every time I hear that story about what it means to paddle like a girl and people thinking that they can't do something or that they, you know, that, or they would look, they wouldn't look enough like a woman or that Mm -hmm. doing something like a girl means that they do it weakly and and like a press Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, to me, just listening to that story, I always find to be uh so sad like mm-hmm. just emotional mm-hmm. because that that confidence and that's one of the things i think that's so good about sports and that your athletic background that led you into canoeing in this wilderness travel um you know is like is just really resonates with me i remember asking one of your friends wow you know like how did tori gravitate to this so much and they said you know i'm not surprised hey tammy could you take that siren thing away from Wesley, please? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> We're leaving that in. 
<laughs> it's okay. My, not your, yeah. Not your fault. Yeah. Um, anyways. So, uh, yeah. So it's just like, she's like, I'm not your friends. Like, I'm not surprised that Tori got into this at all. Mm -hmm. And, and she, and I guess she knew that maybe you didn't have this uh, outdoor adventure background, but that you just had, had this competitive side and this athletic side mm -hmm. uh, to you. And, you know, it's not like you're from the wilderness. You're from, I guess, what was a small town. Mm -hmm. Um, so that I guess that that confidence in sports really led you here. Yeah. And and I just look at that and think about that within myself and just feel like if that was robbed from me mm -hmm. by society or by by sexism or whatever, how how you know, looking at that and empathizing with that, it just it's so sad. Mm -hmm. It's so devastating. Yeah. So I, that's one of the things when I look at what you're doing with Paddle Like a Girl. And uh, kind of giving that power back to people, yeah. I just think it's just so freaking awe inspiring and amazing. Thank you. You know, I just, well, I just so also proud. Also, you had mentioned you. that I would thank you. I was, yeah. uh, you had mentioned that I was doing CrossFit too before we moved up here, and that yeah. was a huge piece of why I kind of built the confidence in being strong mm -hmm. because my whole life I have been stronger um, just as a woman because I'm, I'm bigger, I'm bigger, and just that's just naturally. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just naturally strong for mm. um my size i don't know anyway so I, but i was always embarrassed like anytime i'd be like with a man and if he couldn't lift something or go, i would be afraid to offer to help or whatever because i'm like i don't mm. want to emasculate anybody never because... an issue around me exactly so anyway so now i'm like i'm not embarrassed by it yeah you know i'm like no i'm, I'm confident in my strength and i, I like being capable and knowing that I'm capable because, um, yeah, that's just, I guess who I am, but I'm also now able to share that with, with women that it's okay to be strong, you know, right. and it's okay to, to feel confident and capable because mm -hmm. we are, you know? So. Yeah. And how do you feel about, uh, um, being one of the only like non whiteies in the, in the space? on whiteies is that well kind of i mean you yeah, go to no, you course. go to tori goes outside instagram page and you talk about uh you want to diversify the mm -hmm. outdoors and that's kind of a, a big thing You're, you see all these manufacturers um where you know all their advertising are just white males and sure there's a lot of white males that do this kind of stuff yeah. but i think there's also a lot more people than you think from mm -hmm. different backgrounds that kind of weren't represented mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so you're seeing kind of a lot of these manufacturers uh putting you know more a diverse lineup of people and a lot of the time authentic people mm -hmm. uh on Which on really cool. into their ads and then you're seeing them on instagram mm -hmm. i felt you know and i think that's helping get other uh other people involved yeah. uh, in it um, I don't know if you could could speak to that a little bit. Do you feel that you have to, you know, not being your average whitey, um, do you feel like that you have to prove yourself more? I yes. don't know how you I could. I certainly do feel like I have to prove myself more because mm -hmm. um, like, yeah, just like I told you, that man asking if we were okay, if we're going to be okay because we're women. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a part of me just being not white, feeling mm -hmm. like, is he asking us this because we're women or because mm -hmm. I'm black? You know, like he's I probably I mean, maybe making... he just was into the brown sugar too, which is a possibility. Um, you know? I'm just assuming that, you know, I mean, everywhere I go, especially living in like a small town, everywhere I go, I'm very aware of, of my skin color of course mm -hmm. right like yeah. just naturally that's um just what i'm constantly thinking about um unfortunately but you are very brave um but anyway so like especially when you go into these ex very white dominated white male dominated spaces like canoeing mm -hmm. you know it is intimidating and i feel a lot of pressure to be very good at what i'm doing right. i don't want to make any mistakes i don't want to slip i don't want to trip i don't want to do the wrong paddle stroke. I don't want it. Like there's just, I need to be perfect at it or, you know, all of those stereotypes. I'm going to prove all of those stereotypes to be right. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mm -hmm. need to be good. Um, and so that's probably yeah. just the additional pressure that I put on myself. Um, I just feel enough like that myself right. or anybody does. Yeah. So I can imagine that uh, a, a lot of that extra pressure on you might make some people say, yeah. you know, maybe I don't want to do this. So I'm just hoping that me doing what I'm doing and just having a little bit of an online presence can inspire other people to mm -hmm. um, get out there and feel like, well, I'm not the only one 
doing this as a black woman, you know, mm. I can do this too. And the more black women there are, black men or women or whatever mm-hmm. who are out doing it, the less odd it will become. Mm-hmm. Um, not that it is odd, but it won't be this uh, thing that people need to ask questions about or, you mm-hmm. know, it's just going to be, well, there's another canoeist over there, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm just hoping that I can, you know, I'm by no means any type of activist or mm-hmm. anything like that. I'm just hoping that my presence, mm-hmm. um, will, will help. Um, yeah. and, and yeah, I'm like, even this year I'm, um, looking to kind of expand paddle like a girl and I've found mm-hmm. this other wicked paddler, um, Alicia who wants to, be a part of it. And so she's going to take on running some workshops and I'm like, perfect. Mm -hmm. She's mixed. She's a wicked paddler and, um, knows her stuff. Like she's worked for like outdoor gear, uh, shops and stuff like this. So she really knows her stuff when it comes to gear and she guides and all this stuff. So, um, you know, I just think like just bringing more faces, um, to the the forefront Mm -hmm. that might not look like your typical paddler, will just help diversify the sport and make, yeah. you know, make people like me feel more comfortable when you're stepping, getting out onto the water because that's what it's all about. Right. Where, uh, and, and that's, uh, she worked for the BIPOC outdoor gear library. And- no, she's, um, I worked with her for Kawartha land. Uh, we did, um, a collaborative thing for Kawartha land trust and she was actually working with, Oh geez. Now I'm forgetting the name of the store. This is embarrassing. It doesn't matter. Um, anyways, oh. why can't, I remember the name of the store. A store in, in Bob Cage? In or? like Peterborough. Um, okay. Yeah. So she's in the Quarthas. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, she came out to a workshop to shadow Sherry and I last year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, well, I was already based on our event that I did with her. I was already impressed by her paddling skills and just her knowledge. So I was just immediately was like, she can be somebody who's going to be, mm-hmm. uh, you know, running a workshop for sure. So this year, I'm just finally going to do it. I'm just going to stop being so afraid of offering more locations and dates and all that stuff. So and there's going to be more Paddle Like a Girl this mm-hmm. year, more opportunities. Yeah, okay, in different okay. locations, yeah. Where can people check this out? Like where, if, if somebody's interested in taking um, one of your workshops, either a day workshop or, or multi-day workshop with camping and prepared meals, where can they go sign up? PaddleLikeAGirl.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can find all the workshop dates on there and you can sign up on there. There's also like a little bit of merch. You can buy a t-shirt or a decal mm-hmm. decal decal. I, I say decal. I say decal too. Um, and yeah, so it's, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this year. Nice. Yeah. That's super exciting. So uh, we have a lot of stuff planned for this year. In fact, We've been discussing going to the Yukon as a family to do a canoe trip there in the fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How are you feeling about that? That I'm excited about. Yeah. Yes. So, so the, the going back to the beginning of our conversation, the stickeen and the incessant rain, and mm-hmm. I think we had a bear hanging outside of camp and the canoe blowing away. Mm-hmm. Totally excited to go to the Yukon regardless. Yeah. So even though that you said you're... Every 100% time you, of the time loaded every with anxiety. Time, every time you go to the Yukon, it's a beautiful, perfect weather. It really is. So we better get perfect weather. <laughs> but we're going, what, end of August? Yeah. I mean, that's the same time we did. Well, we did this to Keen mm-hmm. mid-September. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we get there during a time where it's actually going to be nice weather and not, um, yeah. you know, but... Yeah, I'm excited. The Yukon is beautiful. I've never mm-hmm. been to the Yukon in the summer. We've been there in the winter, and it was right. minus forty the entire time. It was minus cold. thirty eight. Let's be let's be honest here, honey. Yes, yeah, sorry, minus thirty eight. Yeah, it was cold. Remember, it was, but remember cold. when we were sitting in the hot springs? So we we did this mm-hmm. crazy snowmobile trip, and we were it was like minus thirty, but we're in these beautifully warm hot springs, looking up at the mountains and crazy northern, northern lights. lights. Oh, so yeah, yeah. so. I am. I'm excited. And longer days, it'll be, you know, it'll be, I think it's going to be good. And then also it's not going to be as intense of a river as Stikine. No. It'll no. be a little bit more of a leisure paddle. Not that the paddle. Stikine's intense, but there are some churning currents. And There's a lot of tricky and, currents that yeah. I don't know if I needed to be so freaked out about, but mm. you know, it's good to have, be cautious, but yeah. So I'm, I'm, no, I'm really looking forward to it. And we're not road tripping it out there. We're flying out there. Yeah. 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 Are we going to take the dog? I think we should. Yeah. We can, yeah. I think we great. should too. Yeah. Awesome. So um, what is it like being married to a professional adventurer? 
Well, I mean, I signed up for this. So um, even though you have to leave for extended periods of time, it is what I knew I signed up for when I was marrying you. So um, I do have the luxury of being self-employed and working from home too. So um, we our schedules can be very flexible, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and also it's just so cool and fun. Everything's like, you know, it's an adventure. You know, mm-hmm. our job is to plan expeditions and canoe trips and like all the logistics that go with it and film Mm -hmm. them. And like, it's a lot, a lot of work. I don't think people really realize how much work it is before, during and after, Mm -hmm. but it's, I'm like, what else would I rather be doing? As stressed out as I am because we're so unorganized and and everything's chaotic. It can be a bit of a shit show. It's, I'm like, what I, I, I did the nine to five. Mm -hmm. I worked at an insurance company. Mm -hmm. I hated it very Mm -hmm. much and i would very much not like to have to go back and do anything like that yeah so yeah i think it's like this is what i signed up for it's fun it's exciting it's Mm -hmm. something new and like you're very passionate and you're always coming up with new projects that i have to become an expert at very quickly overnight like podcast podcast production (laughs) for example your producer so you know it's i'm just thrown in like a video editor like i have a lot of titles that i can add to Mm -hmm. my resume if i ever do need to go and work for somebody else but i'm learning a lot you know and uh i feel yeah i I don't know it's not what i would have if if a 14 year old me would never have expected Mm -hmm. me to be doing this so do you find it's hard you 14 year old you wouldn't have expected what did you expect to do at 14 i mean uh i have no idea no so fair enough what uh isn't it hard when i have to leave for because you know some of these trips i do in the yukon they might be 14 day canoe trips but then there's a couple days on either end and i'm gone for 21 days in the middle of the summer you have your paddle like a girl workshops you're trying Mm -hmm. to juggle the kids I'm not there to help with that. Uh, do you find it hard when I'm gone for that yeah. long? Yeah, I find yeah, I find it hard, but I also um, it's also a little bit easier. I, I'm sorry to tell you what. <laughs> I, like obviously, I miss you, and um, mm. it's challenging with the kids, but like. Mm-hmm. It's one less person to clean up after. Right. Well, that's a good point, and also we are together, all working the together all the time. Like literally, which our, is actually our a miracle. computers are like. Yeah. beside each other <laughs> so like we're together 24 mm-hmm. 7 and then you go away for like three weeks mm-hmm. and then we're back together for 24 7 right. so like it's not like you're away for like six months out of the year uh-huh. you know when you're here we're together right. all day it's not like i'm going away eight hours a day we're together all day yeah. so it's it's nice it's like mm-hmm. um you know absence makes the heart grow fonder right like that's a very true statement mm-hmm. and as much as it's nice to not have to clean up after a you know, fourth human in the house. Mm-hmm. I miss you. I and do it's clean nice. the kitchen. And, and then stuff. I am excited for you to come back and we, mm-hmm. <laughs> and we can, you know, chat and catch up and you tell yeah. me about your trip and I tell you about what happened when you were away. And like, yeah, it's, I think it's a healthy thing. And like, the, again, this is what I signed up for. I wasn't about to be like, you can't go on adventures anymore now that we have kids because this is what I signed up for. I knew you were an adventurer. What are you going to go get a job at the slaughterhouse? Right. And I also am building something and you can see it's working. I'm able to monetize doing these adventures and share it with people and inspire people. Exactly. And and and, and that's makes in turn me happy and, and helps me become a better parent and all that kind of stuff Absolutely. too. So, so you grew up in Newmarket, Ontario, which, you know, it's, I guess now a suburb of Toronto, but at one time was its own town um, before development and urban sprawl and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you're, you're not living sort of in the bush where a lot of people would consider where we live now. A lot of people would consider where we live now to be like remote, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And, um, you know, and we live, we don't live in Magneto One Village. We live outside of Magneto One Village. And most people around here are just cottagers. They come up on the weekends in the summer um, and we are on a river. So um, what what was it like? Was it like a bit of a shock to you? I, I wouldn't say it was a bit of a shock, but was was it a change? What how did you feel kind of going from somewhere where you could order a pizza to going where to somewhere to moving to somewhere where you get eight feet of snow in the winter and there's not really any services close by Mm -hmm. and there's other things like what what were you not used to um I feel like I handled the change pretty 
well. Like I don't, I didn't really feel like there was anything I missed very much. Like we, mm-hmm. uh, before we moved up here, we we were going out for dinner a lot. We were. Like well, probably, I just went alone. So I was starving and I had a bunch of money and, and I wanted really, to spend it on food. We lived really close to State and Maine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was kind of glad that we it, we couldn't just go out for dinner and we right. could spend a lot of money all the time because we started saving money and also just started cooking more, um, you know, and so that I was it was, was good. And then also just like being in t- more intentional with our trips to town, like intentional yeah. with the grocery shopping instead of like. Oh, I can run to the store really quickly. It's like, well, it's 40 minutes to like a grocery store, a grocery store. So mm-hmm. I had, to, I have to be more intentional. Okay. When do we really need to go grocery shopping? Can we make do with what we have until, you know, next Wednesday when I have to pick up Wesley's medicine and kind of do it mm-hmm. all at once instead of just like running in willy nilly for whatever reason to get something stupid that I don't really need. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I think it's kind of fun. And then we also have these things that we need to do around the house. Like, you know, to get ready for winter and like it's it's feels more involved we have more space we can do like gardens and um and yeah i don't know it's i think it's fun i I also like driving so i don't mind the extra drive to get to the store or um you know to go visit my sister or family or whatever Mm -hmm. it's kind of you know it's it's an excuse to go for a, a drive or whatever but um i feel like i handled it pretty well uh the the most challenging part is not being able to just go out with friends on a whim Mm -hmm. and also like for a short period of time. Like I can't just be like, I'm going out for dinner with my girlfriends to catch up. It's very much, okay, when am I going down to the city next? Mm -hmm. Where am I going to stay overnight? Cause I'm not driving down there and back in one day. Right. Um, I'm missing a lot of like little things that my friends invite me to like birthdays and, and like certain things like that, that I feel like I should be go attending, but Mm -hmm. I do feel It just, I can't, you know, like we're just so busy. And then on top of that, it's far. So I feel a lot of guilt in that aspect. Um, So no issues with like four feet of snow, mice in the house, um, power outages. Everyone has mice in their house, don't they? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, And power outages, that's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, that is all it adds to the excitement. We got to get the generators ready. I love just the, uh, the speaking of four feet of snow, I have to leave. Oh, really? Okay. I love just cutting our own wood, just feeling more self-sufficient, kind of having a bit of a homestead too. Yeah. Living closer to nature, looking out the window and seeing deer on your lawn, being able to fish and swim right in your own river. That's something I was going to mention actually. Yeah. Was that it? The difference is that now when people come up, they're coming for a night, an mm-hmm. overnight. So it is like a destination for people, which is kind of fun. Like it's like they can think of this as their cottage. Um, and now we have friends that live up here too. And now, we, yeah, we've made friends mm-hmm. that are local, which is really nice. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, like, and then also your your friend group becomes um, like smaller as they do as when you get older. Like I think that's just natural. But the people that you're inviting up are people that. Um, you want to spend that kind of time with because mm-hmm. you can't really, you don't want to invite just like an acquaintance that you can tolerate over a dinner. Um, mm-hmm. You don't want them like necessarily coming to your house for a full weekend. <laughs> right. So, so it's intentional. Okay. Who's yeah. coming up this weekend? Who do I really yeah. want to spend that quality time? Who am I comfortable yeah. waking up to being in my kitchen yeah. at first thing in the morning, you know, while I'm in my pajamas and my hair is a mess. So. I honestly, that's a really good point. I never even thought about that, but it's true. Okay. Well, I mean, well, I, I wanted to ask you, so can, do we have time for one more question, honey? I know okay. you got to go pick up Hudson. I okay. love you. So your Instagram page, Tori goes outside is kind of awesome. Mm-hmm. And uh, Thank you. you act, you're very welcome. And you actually have a video right I didn't now. Mean to that's, say, mm-hmm, like, yeah, I know. Oh yeah. I meant, it's like, Oh, mm-hmm, thank you. <laughs> oh yeah. Just whatever. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, no, I get it. You're very, very humble, very humble. That's fine. I noticed that uh, you have a video on there right now of Hudson. That's got like 45 million views or more. It's just going completely bonkers. And I love what you've been doing is you've been taking really organic footage from our existing trips Mm -hmm. and you've been editing it into specific Instagram format, Mm -hmm. but almost kind of making a bit of a meme out of it. Is that, could you describe it like that? Um, so, you know, I, I see things that we caught on camera that we didn't intentionally catch. So yeah, yeah I'll just like take little clips. Like mm. for example, just yesterday I came across a, a, me and it's a, you doing an interview and me in the background, like s- whisper swearing at the tent because I had 
kicked a peg out again for like the fourth <laughs> time and I was just already on edge and mm. annoyed. And so I just see myself just like swearing in the background of you like t- telling an interview. So I just little things like that I just find funny and maybe relatable. Yeah. So I feel like if people can relate to that kind of stuff, then I, I make a little reel out of it. So I guess it's a, I guess you could call it a little meme. Amazing. Well, okay. I guess uh, maybe it's time to call this quits. I'll just ask you one more question at the end of the day. Um, what would you say to anybody that uh, wants to try giving the outdoors a shot? And, you know, maybe they're a woman that might be a little bit nervous. Um, can you give any words of encouragement or inspiration to somebody that might want to give it a shot? Yeah. I mean, I would just say um, if you're new to it and you want to get into it, just start small. Um, you know, you can read books on it or watch YouTube videos, but just start small, start with what you know you would be comfortable with and just gradually add on to it or make it a little bit more challenging, whatever you need to do. Um, and just because if you didn't grow up doing it, that's okay. There's still so much time. I know people who didn't get into it until they were like 65 and they were retired. Like there's always time. Um, and you gradually, gradually learn, what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy. You don't have to go canoe canoeing if you're afraid of the water or whatever. You can go backpacking, hike in somewhere, um, and work your way up. Um, don't sign yourself up for too much to start because then it, you mm-hmm. might have a bad experience and you might never want to try it again. <laughs> True enough. So find a, a nice, happy um, balance where you know you're enjoying it, but it has that right amount of challenges that you can kind of overcome and grow and um, build some uh, character with it as well. Amazing. Tori, thanks for venturing into Baird country. Thank you. It seems like you live here all the time, I imagine. I know.